This is the module on spillover, externalities, and general equilibrium effects in randomized control trials, part of the Partnership for Economic Policies Policy Impact Analysis. There were some recent debates about the usefulness of randomized control trials for policy evaluation and formulation in developing countries. Randomized control trials have several advantages. On the one hand, their internal validity allows us to have a precise identification of causal effects and their empirical analysis is relatively easy with very weak assumptions needed to infer causality. This experimental revolution in developing economics is part of a wider credibility revolution in empirical economics and policies in developing countries have been especially suited for experimentation, which has been used in the recent past with great success. In regards to the recent debates on randomized control trials, there are two important critiques to be looked at. On the one hand, critics say that RCTs focus mainly on local partial equilibrium studies with small-scale results. They argue that these small experiments do not capture spillovers and general equilibrium effects. On the other hand, critics have also pointed out that randomized control trials often focus on small questions and therefore social experiments have only limited value because they focus on very small interventions which, by definition, work only in very narrowly defined contexts and are not informative about big questions. In this module, we will study spillover and externalities effects in experiments that will allow us to address some of these critiques. In another module, we will cover experiments that focus on important questions about long-run development. We will start with a case study on indirect and general equilibrium effects of cash transfer programs, which have been very popular in the developing world in the last couple of decades. The first case study is based on the Progressum program in Mexico and is based on a paper published in the American Economic Review called Indirect Effects of an Aid Program. How do cash transfers affect ineligibles consumption? PROGRESA was a national anti-poverty program in Mexico that started in 1997, which had about 5 million beneficiaries by 2004. Eligibility was based on a poverty index. The program consisted of cash transfers that were conditional on school attendance and health care checkups for children and pregnant women in the program. The transfer was fairly large. It represented about 40% of average income for each of the households. At the community level, this represented a huge helicopter drop of about 10 to 20% of local income. One of the reasons Progressa was so popular in terms of studies was that it was based on rigorous impact evaluation with very rich data that was built into the program's deployment. The evaluation was based on a sample of 506 communities with 24,000 households. The baseline data collection was in 1997 with a follow-up in 1998. This was a more complex design than a simple treatment and control, as we will see in the following slides. The assignment was not done by household or individual, but at the level of the community. There are many outcomes of interest in the case of Progressa, but we will concentrate on consumption per capita. Our broad question is, what is the effect of Progressa on consumption per capita? And let us say that the government has a target that the program will be scaled up nationally if its impact is an increase of $20 or pesos or more on beneficiaries' consumption per capita. The Progressa experimental design was deployed in 506 rural villages in a poor area of Mexico, of which 320 were randomized into Progressa and 186 were randomized out, becoming the control group. Within both groups of villages, a poverty eligibility threshold was determined so that individuals or households classified as poor were eligible for the program and non-poor individuals or households were ineligible for the program. So we had poor individuals in eligible and ineligible villages and non-poor individuals in both eligible and ineligible villages. 
The community level randomization of the program implied that there were treatment and comparison communities. Within treatment communities, there were ineligible and eligible individuals. And of course, we ended up with some enrolled individuals and not enrolled individuals. But we will not cover the latter for this lecture. So what happens in comparison communities? Again, we have ineligible non-poor individuals and eligible poor individuals. But none of these eligible individuals are enrolled in the program because they belong to the control or comparison communities. What is the direct treatment effect of the program? How do we compute it? The program evaluation compares the consumption of eligible individuals in treatment and comparison communities. The impact, for instance, in the simple example, was an average consumption of six for eligible individuals in treatment communities and four for eligible individuals or households in comparison communities. Thus, the program's treatment effect was simply six minus four equals two. How do we compute spillovers and what do we mean by spillovers? We want to test whether the program had an effect over and beyond enrolled or direct beneficiaries and for that, we need to check the outcomes for ineligible individuals and for the whole population in comparison communities. How do we do this? Well, we need to compare the outcomes for ineligible individuals in treatment and comparison communities. And what is the intuition? In comparison communities, ineligible individuals will, by definition, not benefit at all from the program. However, in treatment communities, if the eligible individuals spend their money within the community or hire workers or do something with their money that might benefit individuals in the treatment communities, even if they are not directly involved, then the right control group will be the randomly assigned comparison communities. For that, we need to look at the ineligible individuals in them because they are non-poor and are therefore similar to the individuals not directly benefited by the program and treatment communities. This is exactly what Angelucci and DiGiorgio do in their American Economic Review paper. They define the indirect treatment effect as a difference in outcomes for individuals in the treatment communities, but that do not participate. That's the left side of the slide and they compare it with the expected or average result, in this case consumption, for individuals in the comparison communities, that is, with t equals zero, but there are also non-participants, ineligible, and that is the second part of the equation. We can see in this table, Table 1 from the American Economic Review paper, that the average monthly food consumption for adults was positive and substantially higher for ineligible individuals in treatment communities than for ineligible individuals in comparison communities. This is indicated in the second and third panels of the table where we see that there are positive indirect treatment effects besides the already known average treatment effects from the program. This is true for the November 1998 May 1999 and November 1999 follow-up surveys in the program. So what are the results for this American Economic Review paper by Angelucci and DiGiorgio? Cash transfers to eligible households indirectly increased the consumption of ineligible households living in the same village. The program benefits ineligible households living in treatment villages by increasing their food consumption level by about 10% which is approximately half the size of the increase in food consumption for eligible individuals. According to the authors, this effect operates through insurance in credit markets. Ineligible households benefit in that they increase their consumption from the transfer by receiving more gifts through higher loans and transfers from family and friends and by reducing their savings. And that is the main result in this paper. It shows that there are spillover effects from the Progressa Conditional Cash Transfer Program that benefited the whole community, not only eligible individuals in the treatment communities. The positive income shock for a group of households benefits the entire village, and this is consistent with the presence of informal credit insurance markets in developing countries. The effects are large, and if they were neglected, they would result in a 12% underestimation of the average treatment effect of consumption for the treated villages. The transfer benefits the local economy at large, 
looking only at the effect on treated individuals, underestimates the full impact of the program. This is a very relevant policy statement because analyzing the effect of conditional cash transfer programs should be done at the entire local economy rather than on the treated households only. In this case, it was very useful to use village-level randomization. Why do we say that neglecting this type of effects would affect the estimates of the program's impact? Since we would usually only concentrate on households that directly received the transfer, we would be ignoring those other positive effects for non-eligible individuals in treated communities. We can also look at this type of effect in other settings. In this case, we will cover a paper called General Equilibrium Effects of Cash Transfers, Experimental Evidence from Kenya, by Egger, Hauschofer, Miguel, Nyhaus, and Walker. In this paper, we present a more sophisticated example of measurement of spillovers. This is a complex experiment that was designed specifically to capture general equilibrium effects. The American Economic Review paper that we just saw on Progressa was an ex-post analysis. The idea of capturing indirect effect was not built into the evaluation of the program. It was looked at ex-post by these authors. So the question in this Kenya paper is how large economic stimuli can generate individual and aggregate responses. This is a central question in economics at large that has not been studied experimentally. In this experiment, the authors test the effect of a one-time cash transfer of about a thousand US dollars, a very large transfer, to about 10,500 poor households across 653 randomized villages in rural Kenya. The implied fiscal shock was over 15% of local GDP, so again, this is a fairly large helicopter drop of money into these villages. The main difference with Progressa is that in this case, this is a one-time large cash transfer, whereas in the case of Progressa, we had monthly cash transfers for individuals over a longer period of time. This paper and the intervention are based on the Give Directly non-governmental organization. The partnership between the academics behind the study and this organization directly selected the study area based on high poverty levels. Within this area, the organization selected rural villages in which it had not previously worked, which ended up with a final sample of 653 villages spread across 84 sublocations in Kenya. The mean village has about 100 households with about 4.3 members in each household and 2.3 children per household. The average survey respondent was about 48 years old and had six years of schooling. 97% of these households were engaged in agriculture, and some of them were also engaged in wage work and self-employment. The transfer in the data collection took place from mid-2014 to early 2017, which was a period of steady economic growth and relative prosperity and political stability in Kenya. In this slide, we can observe the study design, the timeline, and the data collection, and we can see that the program's evaluation had several instances of data collection from baseline census to household enterprise and market price surveys. In this slide, we observe the geographical dispersion of households in the study in Kenya. In this first table from the paper, we can observe the impact on expenditures, savings, and income. The main results in this table are an increase in household in annualized household expenditure in both non-durable and durable expenditures, and an increase in assets reflected in higher housing value and an increase in annualized household income. In this slide, we can observe the spillover effects. This is an example of the type of spillovers that the authors compute. We can see that for households that are within a given range of 0 to 2 kilometers of eligible households, there are benefits even for non-participant households. For instance, taking the figure in the left-hand side for households that are in areas with a share of about 80% of eligible households, consumption goes up significantly by about 200 and 300, even for households that are not direct beneficiaries of the program. 
The findings from this paper show that there are large impacts on consumption and assets for the recipients and large positive spillovers on non-reception households and firms with minimum price inflation. One of the concerns for programs of this type that carry out large transfers to households in these areas is that some of these might be translated into price inflation, which would in turn reduce the real income of households. But they did not find any effect of this. The authors find a local transfer multiplier of about 2.4, which means that for each dollar spent in these areas, about $2.4 of impact have been found because of these multiplier effects of the additional expenditure from beneficiary households. This is an important study with implications beyond development. In fact, this is close, as close as we can get, to an experimental paper in macroeconomics that measures the effect of fiscal multiplier. Of course, there is a caveat. This is a very large transfer, and it was implemented by a committed partner, which might be hard to replicate at scale. But in any case, it is a good example of how a randomized control trial can inform us about important questions and about spillover and externalities effects. Let's wrap up on randomized control trials and general equilibrium effects of cash transfers. There are several papers that we will not cover in detail in this lecture that have attempted to capture the spillover effects covering Progresa and other programs in Mexico, but also programs in the Philippines. For Progresa, we know that there are effects in food consumption among eligible households and also a reduction in poverty incidence at the village level, with positive spillover effects on non-beneficiary secondary school attendance and attainment, as well as better health care behavior and fewer sick days even for non-beneficiaries. There was no evidence of inflationary impacts of transfers that we saw in Mexico and in the program in Kenya which had large effects, in this case, from an unconditional, not a conditional, trust cash transfer program. The following example of externalities and general equilibrium spillover and effects is a case study of deworming and schooling outcomes in Kenya. This is based on the paper called Worms, Identifying Impacts on Education and Health in the Presence of Treatment Externalities by Edward Miguel and Michael Kremer, published in Econometrica in the year 2004. What is the author's motivation? Do child health investments increase adult living standards? This is the main motivating question. The author is focused on the problem of worm infections in rural Kenya. We know that one in five people in the world are infected with intestinal worms, and this is a major disease burden because of the impacts on anemia, on stunting and other health consequences. This is especially prevalent among children in Africa and Asia. Worms may have other adverse consequences for the immune system as well, and they are prevalent in western Kenya. The transmission of these worms is through frequent reinfection with fecal matter, and though worms can have a limited lifespan, the reinfection rates imply that this can have consequences over a longer period of time. This paper was published in 2004 in Econometrica and, in fact, it is one of the reasons why Michael Kremer was awarded a Nobel Prize in Economics. Worms have infected more than one quarter of the world's population. Besides the importance of this question, this paper represented an important methodological innovation at the time. When medical treatment is randomized at the individual level, we are potentially underestimating the benefits of the treatment because we are missing the externality benefits to the comparison group that appears from the reduced disease transmission. We are also underestimating the benefits for the treatment group as well because of the lower contagion from individuals in the control group. The intervention and its impact evaluation were designed with these externalities in mind to capture their effects. The author was able to make a project in Kenya in which school-based mass treatment with deworming drugs was randomly phased into schools rather than to individuals. The authors concentrated on a rural district with more than 90% worm infection rates at the baseline because of recent flooding. The treatment was cheap and easy. It was administered by means of drops in the mouth and it cost about 50 cents per child. 
This program was stratified by geographical zone, and there were three waves of the program from 1998 to 2003. In this table, we can observe the main results from the evaluation of the program. In panel A, we can see that worm infection rates decreased by about 25 percentage points for the treatment group, or from 52 to 25 percent. And this translates into other outcomes. For instance, a reduction of reporting being sick in the past week of about 4 percentage points from 3.45 to 0 0.41 and other positive effects such as a reduction in the proportion of children being anemic. In this table, Table 7 from the original paper, we can see the strategy developed by the authors to capture externalities. In the first line, we have the indicators for Group 1 that are individuals in the treatment group in 1998, but in the second line, we have the proportion of Group 1 students within 3 kilometers per 1,000 pupils. And in the third line, we have the proportion of Group 1 students within 3 to 6 kilometers. What we observe in this table is that there is a reduction in infection rates for all students living nearby students who were treated, independently of whether they were treated or not. These results, there are more results in the table, but we will concentrate on this first column, indicate that there is an externality effect as posited by the authors Living near students who have been immunized from the infection has also a positive impact in children who were not directly treated with this drug. What are the short-run effects? The results indicate that the mass deworming led to schooling gains and to the community health benefits at a low cost. The rates of serious infections fell by half and the program reduced school absenteeism by one quarter and increased school participation and it was far cheaper than any other alternative ways that we know to boost school participation. The deworming substantially improved the health and school participation among untreated children in both treatment schools, but also in neighboring schools. And this is the externality part of the program. These externalities are large enough to justify fully subsidizing the treatment. The deworming aid did not improve academic test scores and the reinfection among other committee members was still present. So what are the conclusions from these studies? It is feasible to study spillovers, externalities and general equilibrium effects in the context of randomized control trials. These are not necessarily problems or impediments for randomized control trials. In fact, by studying externalities, we are adding layers of complexity to our understanding of how policies work. However, we need to plan ahead, but this is not a problem. Externalities and general equilibrium effects are not a problem for the evaluation of policies if we build the analysis of these features in the experiment's design, like the Kenya paper for unconditional cash transfers did, or like the paper on the deworming. So, we first need to think about the theory and talk to program implementers and potential beneficiaries to understand the type of spillover effects that might be present so we can build them into our evaluations. We need to write them down and specify what we can expect in our pre-analysis plan, and we need to include these effects in our power calculations. Finally, we need to be aware that the presence of potential spillover effects has implications on the level of randomization. We will need to randomize at the school level, the school district level, and the village level if we want to capture these externalities because we need to be able to study outcomes at larger degrees of aggregation.